Hello, church family, and welcome to KCC Online. For the last few weeks, we've had a lot of fun going to different locations and using different backgrounds uh, for our sermons. This week, you can see that I'm back in front of the black backdrop because I, I want to make sure that we hear the heart of today's message and we don't get distracted by where's Tom and what's Tom trying to prove. This isn't the first time that I've uh, preached a sermon called Set Free. The first time that I tried to do this sermon, uh, it, wasn't, it was from a different passage, but it was an Easter sermon when we were in Ames. And as the video played, I came up from the back in the center aisle, and I had this black hoodie on. It was great big. I, I had borrowed it from a guy, and uh, I had chains, all kinds of chains wrapped around me. The point was of the sermon was that we can be set free from our bondage. I was thinking in my mind, as I, I thought about this illustration, I was thinking that they would get the idea that I was like Jacob Marley from The Christmas Carol. But that's not what happened. Some people, I think, may have got that view, but the younger people in the audience, including my own kids, they, they, got, they got to laughing quietly. I didn't hear them at the time because they, they thought I was trying to pull off that I was an MMA fighter or a boxer or something like that. My, my attempt at being dramatic actually took away from the message and some people missed the message. So today, black, simple, and I just want to talk to you. I just want you to hear the message of what it means to be set free by an encounter with Jesus Christ. As a church, we've been going through the book of Acts. We started with our sermon series, Ecclesia, when we learned what it means to truly be the church. And we learned that the church isn't about a building. And it's a good thing because we're not in a building right now. But now we're in this sermon series and we've been going through it for a few weeks called Encounters. And we're looking at how different people encountered Jesus in different ways. But there are three similarities that I think we can pick up throughout the entire sermon series. The first one is, is that people are really transformed when they have a real encounter with Jesus. Their lives are never the same. The second point is, is that God, since Genesis 3 that we talked about some last week, has always been seeking us. So he initiates the contact. He initiates the encounter. And then the third thing is, is that there's usually a disciple, almost always a disciple. There's a, a human element involved in which by obeying the leading of the Holy Spirit, we as disciples, we help make that introduction. We help the encounter between people and Jesus. This morning, as we, uh, we get into Acts 16, uh, we're going to continue in our story there. Before we get there, I want us to bring in some context because I think that we uh, we can just very realistically think that, well, I can't do what they did in the Bible. You know, they were somehow very special people. They were anointed. They had special gifts. They, they just did things that we can't do in 2020. The, they were almost like they, were, they weren't even human. They were special. Well, I want us to see, before we get started, from Acts 15, if it's easy to find, there is a, a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Remember, they were the, the magic team. The, you know, uh, they were this great dis, uh, traveling team of missionaries. And yet, here we pick it up in verse uh, 38. It says, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and the, visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Wow, shepherding. Well, let's go check on all these people. Let's go check on all these new disciples. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with him. But Paul did not think it was wise because he had deserted them on their first journey. So they had this disagreement. In fact, it says it was such a sharp disagreement that Paul and Barnabas split ways. You know, here's two very powerful, influential people in the Bible great missionaries, and yet they had this disagreement, and the disagreement was so sharp, so bad, that they couldn't get along any longer together. So they, they split apart. And as always, God uses things to his advantage. He, 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 he makes a bad situation better. And by this, now we have two teams, because uh, Barnabas takes off with John Mark, who later becomes the author of the book of Mark. 
And then Paul takes with him this guy named Silas. Now, Silas, he entered the story because uh, not only are human, uh, are the disciples human, the churches, they, didn't, they weren't always perfect, and there was a, a disagreement in the church. And so they had this big council, and when it was time to report back to, and go tell the, the people, they sent Paul and Barnabas, but they also sent some people from Jerusalem, and one of them was Silas, because they, wanted, they didn't want um, Paul and, and Barnabas to be the only ones to deliver the message. Because honestly, wouldn't we be suspect? Well, yeah, you're giving us this message because that's the message you wanted. But they brought along these other people, and one of them was this guy named Silas. We really don't know much more about him, other than obviously him and Paul got along well, and he was willing to go with Paul on his second missionary journey. Now, with all of that as context, and we see the humanity of these disciples, that, you know what, there's just times when they didn't get along either, that there was a problem we can get into our story in Acts 16. Well, we're going to pick up the story, um, starting with verse 16. And it says, once when we, now, uh, let me, sorry, we're still in uh, Philippi. Last week we did Lydia. She was, we saw her conversion story. And now we just pick up the very next thing. And, and some, some time has passed. And we know this because um, at the end of this story, we know that Paul and, and Silas, they go to the house of Lydia, and that's where the believers were. So there was a church had started. All right, now, going back to. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Since she kept this up for many days, finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the, <clears throat> the leaders and said, These men are Jews, and they are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for the Romans to accept or practice. Well, we, here's our first person. We see this slave girl being set free by an encounter with Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very interesting one, right? She, she was obviously filled with an evil spirit. And, and again, we see this humanity of Paul because he gets annoyed. He's like irked. He's like upset. And he's finally like, I've had it up to here, out of her, all right? And that's just a really interesting story. And, and I think that Paul probably knew that this was going to cause issues. That's why for many days he'd let it go. I mean, he hadn't freed this girl yet. But when she was free and we see the response of her owners, I think it comes back to what we learned last week about the, the, stat, the status of women in their culture. This, this slave girl was seen as profit and she was seen as property. She wasn't seen as a person. Her owners would rather her be uh, filled by a demon than be set free. And this, I mean, that's just, that's sad. So, but Paul, we see his humanity, we see the situation, but what I want us to pull out of this is that we, we are not property. We are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Uh, we are princes and princesses of the King. Um, we, we, we're not, we shouldn't allow anyone to step on us, to use us. And this girl, she was being used. And so when we are set free by Jesus, when we have this encounter with Jesus, we then become royalty. And we have amazing value. And so don't ever, ever let anyone look down on you or talk bad about you or your faith because you are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the king. And we have this just, we're, we're amazingly loved and we have this incredible value. You are valuable. You are worthy. As we continue, we see that the crowd joined in 
on the attack against Paul and Silas, and the leaders ordered that they be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains became loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We are here. So here we see this group of prisoners are set free. And it causes causes some issues. This is a very dramatic moment. But please understand what has just taken place. Paul and Silas had been publicly beaten. They were stripped. They would have been stripped naked. They were chained in an inner cell. They would have been bloody. And it's at midnight. And, And how are they responding to their circumstances? With prayer and praise. They're singing hymns. That's, that's something we need to pull out of this, even though they're very human. Silas is probably thinking, I didn't sign up for this. You just said we were going to go and, and share the gospel. You didn't say anything about getting beat, all right? But here they are. They're all bloody. They're, they've got shackles on their feet, and they're singing, and they're praising God, and they're praying, you know? And, and so our circumstances should not control our joy, uh, it's just something that we, we have inside of us, and Paul and Silas are showing that. The other thing is, is that um, I want us to understand that Paul and Silas would have been suffering, but yet they're praising. And, and I, I, I know it's really tempting to say, you know, right now with the, the quarantine that, man, we're really suffering, aren't we? I mean, we're, we're stuck on our couches in front of our big screen TVs and our Netflix, uh, you know, we, we have some trials and we have some tribulations right now, yes, and, and things are not as, as we wish they were. But I think we can look at these disciples and, and, and the situation they're in, and we can look at our situation and say, all right, it's not all bad. Okay, just a perspective. I'm not saying that we are not in some difficult times. And I'm not saying that some people are not struggling financially or emotionally. I'm not taking away from that at all. But let's, sometimes we just need to keep things in perspective. The other thing I want us to understand is this amazing power of forgiveness. The jailer, the one who locked them in, is most likely also the same one who delivered the beating. And if Paul had this hardened heart that many of us have today, knowing that the, the jailer is getting ready to commit suicide, we would have let it happen. Just out of vengeance, we would have let it happen. Show him, not Paul. Paul's way more concerned about the salvation of that jailer than he is his own suffering. And we see this amazing forgiveness. And you know, we've, we've all sinned. We've all done things that uh, are horrible. But we've been forgiven. Jesus has forgiven us. And we need to take that grace that we've received and we need to pass it along to others. You know, um, there are probably relationships uh, people that you are holding grudges against. Um, you know, maybe it's a, an ex-spouse. Maybe it's problems you had with your parents. Maybe it's a former employer. Uh, maybe it's even with the church. And there are just some things that there are times that we need to forgive. Now, I also want to make sure that you understand that I'm not saying forget. There are times, there are people that we've had in our lives, there are situations that we've been in that it is not wise in any stretch of the imagination to re-enter into those relationships without some wisdom and without some boundaries. But that doesn't mean that we don't forgive them. We are called and commanded where we are to forgive. And let me just say that when we don't forgive and this bitterness and this anger wells up inside of us, it is only hurting us us. It's not them. In fact, oftentimes they don't even know. They, they're not even thinking about us. And here we are, we're, we're so angry and we're upset and we're stressed. 
And the person that we, we push that all on, they don't even care. So please, please take from this. I mean, Paul and Silas had just been beaten by this guy. And yet they were willing to forgive. So please find the strength to be set free by the power of forgiveness. We take, pick it up again in verse 29. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them, washed their wounds, then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. The, the jailer has been set free. And it's a dramatic one, right? I mean, that's, a, that's a, one of those amazing 180 stories. And I, I want you to understand that he didn't come in to them and necessarily say exactly those words in terms of like, how may I be saved? Um, the word saved, and it, we can, if we go back through scripture, we can see it in different ways. It, also, it means delivered. It kind of means healed. How can I be healed? And in fact, in this situation, I think it says, how can I get out of this mess? How can you help me get out of this mess that I am in? And Paul says, yeah, I've got your answer. And, and see, we may not have people come and say, how can you help me help lead me to Jesus? That's not what they're going to say. They're going to come and they're going to say, hey, I'm in this horrible mess. My life is a mess. My life is a wreck. I am broken. And you can help if you listen to them and what they're saying, you can help them with the encounter with Jesus. But we have to listen first. Now, there is an immediate transformation that we see in this jailer. The same guy who had uh, whipped them and put the, 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 the stripes on their backs is now the same man who is washing them. And you know, I, I can't even imagine what that would have been like, the humility that that jailer would have taken on as he washed the backs of Paul and Silas. You know, and he, he, he was thankful. And maybe he, right before he was getting ready to, to plunge himself on his own sword to commit suicide, maybe he did have this moment where he's like, his life flashed before his eyes. And, you know, maybe you've had that moment where you, you're like thinking and you're like, well, you know what? I, I really don't know where I'm going when the end comes. The one thing that I want us to understand is that, you know, we all have moments of struggle. There's, I mean, Christians, we still can just struggle with depression and anxiety and fear. But I came across this week this definition of fear as false evidence appearing real. And you know, this, this jailer was, he was scared and the evidence was the prison doors were open, but it was false evidence because they were still inside. And this brought him to a place, the supernatural earthquake that see that's God initiating the encounter. And then the disciples following through to help in, make the introduction to Jesus. So see an encounter with Jesus Christ he can set us free from any mess we are in, any mess, no matter where we are in the world, no matter what we've got ourselves into, no matter what the circumstances around us are, he can set us free. Now, I want to make it clear that that doesn't always change the circumstances. Paul and Silas were still prisoners. The jailer was still the jailer. Um, it, it doesn't change their circumstances, but it did give them a different outlook. Now, instead of being enemies, they were brothers. And now, instead of being cruel, he was being kind. See, it, it changes those ways. They were still prisoners, and he was still the jailer. There's still going to be consequences sometimes from our decisions, but now we have a different attitude towards them. See, Paul and Silas, they had, taught, uh, they had shown what it's like to, to be in difficult circumstances with joy. They were um, serving a consequence, if you will, for um, preaching the gospel. Now, 
There's a new attitude in the jailer. He's still the jailer, but can he do it differently? Yeah, absolutely. We can do things differently. It, maybe, maybe being set free by Jesus doesn't, um, doesn't change our circumstances or our consequences, but it does change us as we go through them. This Jesus, who, when he sets us free, we are free forever, forever and ever. And we are completely forgiven. There is nothing in our past that he doesn't forgive us of. I mean, think about the love and grace that he offers um, to, to even like, he, he washed the feet of Judas, knowing that Judas was about to betray him. He, this love is complete. And it is 100%. And there is nothing. He knows everything. So we just need to quit hiding it. The other thing I want us to pick out of this is that we, um, when we have this encounter with Jesus, we're transformed. We're, We're new. We're a new creation. We have a new heart. We have a new outlook. We have a new attitude. But we have to allow other people to have that same opportunity. And I don't mean by sharing the gospel with them. I mean by allowing them to prove that they are transformed, to just um, to not hold them into the, their past. We're, we're in a smaller community. This is a smaller church. You, we know, we, we think we know everybody. We think we know who they are. But I think our, our My Story videos are showing that we don't really know everybody. We don't really know about their encounter with Jesus. And I think that we sometimes have this temptation, well, I know Bill and Bill will always be like that, but you don't know that Bill had a radical transformation. He had this radical encounter with Jesus and he's different. So we have to allow people to be different. What if Paul and Silas hadn't allowed the the jailer to show that he was transformed? What if they hadn't trusted him to wash their wounds? So we we have to just allow the, you were changed, I was changed, I am no longer the guy I was 20 years ago. You most likely are nowhere near who you were before you had your encounter with Jesus. So we have to allow people to be transformed. So as as we wrap this up for the day, I know that there are people who are hearing this message and we've all sinned and you're thinking, I, I've got this stuff in my past that I can't get past. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling. I am struggling with a sin and it just keeps coming back up or, or I'm really, really struggling with a person that I, I can't. I, just, I, I can forgive everybody but that one person. And so I, I just want you to hear that we, we have to. We have to do, as, as we have to let this go. We need to be set free. And you know, there are people in this, in this church family, I know that there are people um, who they've had abortions in their past, or maybe they've committed adultery, or they, they've, uh, they're struggling with alcohol. They've been in an abusive relationship, or maybe they've been the person who was the abuser, struggling with anxiety, struggling with the fact that in their past they've been arrested. You know, I just went through a whole bunch of sins, and I didn't even leave the A's. You want me to go to B's? Look, we all have something in our past and we need to just bring it to Jesus and let this encounter free us of our past, free and and allow that same grace and mercy to be passed on to others. Um, I want you to understand that, you know, when we're set free, it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we're not um, going to struggle. When we're set free, it doesn't mean perfect, it means forgiven. When we're set free, it doesn't mean no more struggles. It just means a different attitude towards them. You know, Paul prayed uh, for God to to remove a thorn. He still had the struggle. Um, Jesus prayed in the garden for God to, to remove the cup. And he still had to go forward and suffer. So, you know, our circumstances don't always change. Set free doesn't mean no more sinning. Paul Paul said that he he never actually fully understood his own capacity for sin. And he he said, you know, I don't understand why I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I know I should do. So he still struggled with it. It doesn't mean mean we're going to be perfect. 
Being set free means that we're free from the condemnation. It means that we are free from guilt and that we are free from the shame because we are fully forgiven. We are fully and deeply loved. We are set free by the love and the blood of Jesus. Listen, if you if you've just heard this for the first time or you, or you know that you've got some struggles and, and you need to be set free, you know, and, and this, is, this is challenging doing this online, but I want you to understand that we are here for you. We are, and and maybe, maybe you need to be like the jailer and you, you need to say, right now, I need help getting out of this mess. Don't, don't put it off just because we're under quarantines and but things are freeing up. And I, I want you to understand that we can do this. We can meet together. We can, I, I wanna be faithful and obedient and, and, and share the gospel with anyone who needs to hear it, regardless of what's, how it has to look because of social distancing. Let me just say, I, I want to be faithful. I want it to happen. If you are struggling with any of this stuff, if you need to be set free, don't let a virus stop you. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for setting us free. Thank you for giving us the blood of Jesus Christ who has washed us, made us clean, and has set us free forever. Lord, um, I just thank you for the truth of your word. I'm thankful for the humanity of the the disciples. Um, Lord, they were not perfect. We're not perfect, but we have a perfect Savior. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See you next week.